Well, you know, we need to first understand what beauty is in our culture today, because we live in such a normalized, decadent climate. Usually when I go to these conferences or when I've done these speaking engagements or I've connected with uh, audiences, meet and greets, what have you, when I use the word beauty, I have often noticed that due to the success of the sector of the world, people often get confused with hotness. So if I use the word beauty, they, they, they're they automatically getting into this frame where they rank the opposite sex on a 1 to 10 rating scale. And I'm like, ah, okay, look, that's wow. all there, by the way, right? But that's beauty, there. That's there, right? But... Yes, yes, that is, that is there. But it's almost like the way I look at it is, um, you know, you read all the writings of the church fathers and they regard beauty as the sacred. What are we talking about? Rabbits. That's the show, guys. Uh, heavy things lightly. History, philosophy, theology. What else? Oh, the anthropology. We do that, too. And we talk about the aid world helping people. Because that's what we do at First Things. www.firstthatchthings.org Today, Arthur Kwan Lee brought up in the Presbyterian Church of Korea. Well, but here in the United States. Interesting character who fought the good fight, who picked a fight with modernity. Uh, he was the New York City Artist of the Year. Young Artist of the Year in 2000, and, uh, I believe it was 19. And then, well, he started to talk too much about stuff that people didn't want to talk about. And that led to a whole host of things, including getting canceled. Arthur is on. He's interesting, unique. Give it a listen. On Watar today, Arthur Kwan Lee, painter and culture warrior. Hey, guys. <laughs> uh, we have a world-class artist on today. And uh, I'm introducing you with the toast, Arthur. Um, I won't say much. I'll let you say something, but I will say this. Uh, an artist on a journey who's trying to figure out something like um, ontology, depth of meaning, what it is to actually be a human being, expressing it, especially in this Pantocrator I want to talk about, Arthur. But mm -hmm. uh, So I'd like to make a toast. This is very Georgian, and you see this at the table that we throw. Uh, I'd like to make a toast to taking something like creation and turning it into something like beauty which of course is what God did. And then may we also imitate the great creation. So to your work, brother, Gagi Marjos. Thank you, brother. Cheers. I don't have I'm a glass, sorry. but- I'm but sorry, I'm I didn't warn you. you as well here. Yes, 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 no, it's fine. It's not Arthur's fault, it's mine. I didn't warn him. <laughs> Cheers to the viewers here. So, okay. So for folks who don't know who you are, how would you define your spiritual disposition, like what's your spiritual biography? Where are you standing vis-a-vis -vis creation, creator? How'd you come up and where are you now? How would you describe that? So I come from a Presbyterian Christian background. My father is a pastor here in Oakton, Virginia. Uh, myself, I have, as an artist, uh, aesthetic differences with rendering figures in the Bible from a Presbyterian canon. So um, that said, I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm holistically a Christian, but from my own Presbyterian community, especially the Korean Presbyterian community here on the East Coast, which tends to be, uh, Koreans tend to be Presbyterians here. Yeah. The depiction of Christian figures, and I'm not talking just about Christ, I'm talking about Jonah and the whale, or, <laughs> or, or um, even same, I mean, you, you know, many of the saints, it's, it's frowned upon. Um, mm. So, it, it, so I, that's something that I have to manage. But um, my belief say? is that. What do the elders say if you come with a really nice rendering? Is it idolatry? Is it that? Is it that narrative? So, John, what I what I see is um, this discourse unfolding in front of me when it comes to my art. 
the reaction from the Christian community, not just the Presbyterian denomination. Uh, before I explain that, let me first say a sentence before that, which is that I am not an intellectual. I'm a romantic. Genuinely speaking, when I'm in the studio, I spend eight hours mixing color pigments and enjoying the creative process. So if I read something biblical, if I hear a podcast that, that is on these subjects and I inspire, and it inspires me, it's like lightning strikes me and I, and I get excited to paint. So that beauty has inspired me to create. So often um, these reactions that I'm getting, it's really unexpected for me. Let me first say that. But the conversation I tend to hear um, outside that pure framework that I'm actually approaching it from, one side says this is blasphemous and um, it's insulting, it's cringe, whatever you want to say. Uh, they tend to be really Bible Belt folk who do that. And then the other side, uh, in response also tends to say, well, you know, these artists, not just myself, many artists of faith depicting biblical subject matter, they're not expecting Christians to worship this as an icon or something mm -hmm. um, uh, false. Um, and they also add that we can't, as Christians, talk about the culture wars if we're not participating in culture. And I, I will say that's something I, that really resonates with me because I really get excited when I hear pastors talking about things like hypergamy hmm. or physical health or uh, like, like relevant issues today that young men are facing. So in the same canon, I, I, in, in that same context, excuse me, I think that artists should be utilizing their creative talent to point upwards. And yeah. it's not a coincidence that the greatest art is always undergirded by Christian subject matter, that to me, that is not a, just a pattern. To me, that implies that actual Christian standard of artistry is high because you're literally pointing upwards. So, so, <laughs> so there, it, there's, there's a certain servitude there that I've always felt connected towards. Okay. And it's, yeah. And so like, that seems to be the discourse that I see though, is many Christians, um, I did fight last feast festival in Knoxville. I don't know if you heard of this conference. It's a big Christian conference. You know, a little over a thousand people come and I had a booth there just to show some Christian art and how we can participate in the cultural front rather than just emptily repeating that politics is done from culture, actually showing how you can influence people. And what occurred is this young man came up to me and he goes, this offends me. And it, this is making me really mad. And then this other pastor comes up. Yes. So, so I'm just kind of sitting here like really like, I'm, okay, I don't, you know, this is, just two forces here, like debating in front of me. And I'm kind of like, guys, guys, the place that I'm painting from is clearly not, it's in reverence. I'm, I'm trying to be like Bezalel here. Right. I'm trying to be a spiritual servant here. Like that's the, that's the intentionality behind why I picked up my brush to share these works. But I understand there's always going to be um, detractors. And, and I will think? also say that. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I, I was just going to add that, like, I'm, I'm open to hearing criticism. Um, not I mean, obviously, I'm not let, letting people insult me, but I'm open to hearing people who are who have excavated, the, you know, the Bible deeper than myself. So that's another sure. thing. Like when this young man came up to me and started lambasting me, it was a little disconcerting because I genuinely will sit and listen to you and and hear your position, but he was too busy seeing red. And, and 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 insulting me, so I I kind of just like was like, all right, well, um, you know, yeah. So there's this yeah, thing going on, right? That you make your story. So there's a million reasons to show love and respect. So you 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 point out he's younger. That alone probably makes him want to yeah. be respectful. But the other thing is, is there's also like technical skill. So you're like incredibly technically skilled. So I always get, I, I love when people jump right to the proposition. They jump, they jump right to the intellectual idea as if it needs defending or, or destroying. And past all these other human realities on the way, like here's a human who's got a mom and dad. It's so interesting that the idea is what motivates people even as they sit among created being human beings so what do you think is it about the proposition of painting 
holy things or godly things. Why do you think people get that heated? You, I feel like you're you're in a position to speak to that because you're doing it. What What do you think? So, so I, I, I I can I can tell you that before I answer that question, we need to do a dive. Um, Let's go. I like it. it, it it's well, you know we need to first understand what beauty is in our culture today because we live in such a normalized decadent climate usually when i go to these conferences or when i've done these speaking engagements or i've connected with uh, audiences meet and greets what have you when i use the word beauty i have often noticed that due to the success of the secular world people often get confused with hotness mm -hmm. <laughs> so if i use the word beauty they they're, they're automatically getting into this frame where they rank the opposite of sex on a one to ten rating scale and i'm like ah, okay like that's wow. all there by the way right but that's beauty, there. That's there, right? But. Yes, yes, that, that, is, that is there. But it's almost like the way I look at it is, um, you know, you read all the writings of the church fathers and they regard beauty as the sacred. The sacred. Mm. The sacred. So beauty is the sacred. We need to make that clear. And the role of the artist is actually to try to bring back that reverence. Like we live in such an irreverent time. Um, and for me, I believe that the reason why this stuff is so touchy is because beauty is the light that shows who the vampires are actually wow that's really what it boils down to because you know when everybody repeats this adage from aquinas the, the true the good and the beautiful right but i don't think we understand as christians it's such an instrumental force utilizing beauty mm. and a, a great mistake that we have is um because most people who are of faith, rightfully so, tend to be more right-leaning. We've also been duped, though, when you look at the current climate, when we look upon what is an investment. And, and this will connect to what I'm saying, because often when we think about an investment, we just think about the digits in your ROI, in your bank account. Mm -hmm. But when you look at the radical left, the way, they, the way they look at an investment is actually controlling culture and the dreamscapes of your progeny. And what I've come to see is that people who believe in the good and believe in who are freedom loving and love the West, uh, you know, they tend to, they, they don't understand that patronage and artistry goes hand to hand. So yeah. most Christian artists today either experience cancel culture as I did, or they cannot work through the traditional pillars, even if their work is actually aesthetically stronger than all the other people. So we're in this weird climate right now where, you know, um, the persecution of Christians is really saturated in the arts and entertainment today. And I believe, and one of my things is, I'm trying to get people to, especially, not even especially, 100% people, men of God, to stand up for what's right in the mainstream more, utilizing talent in the mainstream. I'm really big on that. This because, happened to you, right? You, you got kind of canceled-ish. Maybe yeah, in 2019, canceled. I won Artist of the Year from the Eileen Kaminsky Family Foundation. And that's a really respected residency program internationally. So they're, they're New York City. Um, and New York City is one of the biggest art cities in the world. But in 2019, I won Artist of the Year. And six months later, every single gallery, all six of them I was working with, especially in the Lower East Side, wanted nothing to do with me. And it's simply because I wasn't... Look, it's, it's partly my fault because I was in social camouflage. I was concerned about what's going to happen to my income. Uh, that's brilliantly <laughs> okay. said. Social climate flash. I get it. I get it. <laughs> but, 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 you know, it, it comes down to the fact that my story is not that unique, actually. It's, it's wrong. It's, it's inappropriate that these people, they want you to be as ugly as they are so they don't feel so alone. That's all. I don't care if there's 10,000 people together. That's the same mantra that they're really working on in their own hearts. And I was in this place where I was doing very well. But I basically was, um, I couldn't really speak about my beliefs. Mm -hmm. At the time, I was more conservative. Um, now I'm more anarchist. <laughs> but, okay. but, uh, but, but, but I was a right-leaning Christian artist who could not speak about, you know, could, couldn't speak openly about my stance. And, you know, um, when I started to push back against, even right now, right now as we speak, the most popular shows are still art that's venerating the Rainbow Coalition. Or yep. Black Lives Matter. Still, still to this day, 
And the reason why is because every, every single listener of yours, a very important takeaway to this dialogue is understanding that the whole tug of war in art history, understanding in a nutshell, everything you see in art history is this tension between collectivism and the soul. Art that is worshiping God or trying to spread his majesty or its uh, utilization of the state. And currently, the reason why all the galleries are showing BLM power art or these, these degenerate LGBTQ symbolism is all of that is blatant propaganda. And I believe we have to label it as propaganda. That is propaganda. Yeah. That is nothing but propaganda. If I say Black Lives Matter, the first thing that comes to your mind is a picture of a black flag with the white letters or the black power fist. It's one or the other. If I say, if I, if I talk about the LGBTQ <laughs> agenda, you think about the rainbow flag, of course, you know, or, or um, something equally degenerate. And um, that is all because people have lost touch with actual aesthetic standards, which was always under the scales of Christ. And so the aesthetic standards are born of something like soul or spirit or that which the creator God gave us. And so to deny that and create art is simply propaganda in that it hides our image. So, wow. So you're painting a picture of, of a war. So here's the thing. Everybody knows this already. Not really, yeah. though, not intellectually, perhaps, maybe not with words, or they're afraid to say it. But you found yourself in the battle. I found myself as a historian in the battle when I was basically communist-leaning as a younger guy, and then I started to mm -hmm. read the history. <laughs> you don't want to do that, <laughs> because it kind of throws everything off. Because these, yeah. these cats were coming at people who, like you said, wanted to create light. That's interesting. That's interesting. And so you think the right could do better, whatever the right is. Let's get into that maybe next. But you think the right could do better if they understood this dreamscape of the progeny concept? Like, Well, well, well I, I believe that um, what it boils down to is human beings are actually a lot more circumstantial than we like to believe. And I can say this both anecdotally and strategically. So from the anecdotal lens, why did me as a red-blooded, muscle-bound, fearless man, afraid to speak up in this culture. Obviously, it's toxic, but what it boils down to is because, you know, if we can look at another man, let's say you know there's wrongdoing in your office. You're just an everyday American. But if you push against the dominant narrative, whatever woke agenda there is at the moment, it's, it's, it's one thing to be hated, it's another to be hated and poor, I yeah. guess is what I'm saying. Because if, yeah. if this HR lady can now castigate your income while you have three kids you have to feed and a wife at home, I actually sympathize with that. This is what I mean by circumstantial. And in the same way, look, I, if I can press some magic button that cuts off the welfare state and abortion so that women can act more accordingly and men will actually be incentivized to properly climb this competitive ladder, you know, righteously, then I would press that button. But obviously that button doesn't exist. So what we have to do is first change the culture. Because once you change the culture, people will act accordingly because human beings are circumstantial. No doubt. And yeah. No doubt. How do you do that? I think that's the reality we're talking about when you said everybody knows this, but the solution is changing the actual circumstances. Yeah, I like that. People are practical. Yeah. I think you and I, maybe, I mean, in my family, Whatever, for whatever reason, we produced all these ideas, these impractical people. I think you're probably one of the impractical ones, but it's a really good. I mean, I'm an artist, point. you know, that's like, yeah, <laughs> it's not secure at all, but <laughs> God willing, you know, it's, it's, it's worked out, but you know, it's, it's crazy, risky 10 years of struggling <laughs> to get here. And then when you quote got there, then you had to come face to face with another reality about, about how courageous you wanted to be. You're right, though, about practicality. So how do you go about changing culture, do you think? Well, okay, so the first thing is um, changing culture is, is twofold. It's not enough to actually have producers of culture and beauty and art and film. Like, that's half of it. Actual artistry and talent, that's half of it. The other side is patronage. And this is something that 
um, those who live in sin actually understand because they're more elusive people. But unfortunately, the people who should care about it don't seem to understand that um, having your actual hands in the wheel of culture, the steering wheel, you need to invest in it. So, I mean, you, you look at a film like, like, like Braveheart, right? Mm-hmm. Like that film has done more for our, I understand it's about Scotland, but still in regards to the gross sales in the West, it's done more for our sense of masculinity, uh, respect, honoring fathers, uh, patriotism, these values. It's done more than any political policy or presidential figure ever. Hmm. And that's culture. So, you know, but the patronage behind it was incredible, but we have reaped those benefits and we still continue to do so. So we need to have like, like I can give you an example um, in my sense. industry, in the, yeah. in the fine art industry, um, who is the most rock star uh I guess labeled fine artist today right now who's crushing it. It's a woman by the name of Marina Abramovich. And she literally produces satanic art. She calls herself a performance artist. She's, she's simply a, a Satanist witch, actually. And her goal is to destroy the Western Christian values. And look at her patrons. Wow. Hillary Clinton, you know, uh, Jay-Z and Beyonce, very close with them. Um, Lady Gaga. I mean, I'm sorry. This but isn't some crazy. This is this is known. We know this. Yeah, like it's not. Oh, they don't even have to hide it because yeah. they they, you know, it, it, um, you know, you were you were wanting to mention the the political uh, distinction between the left and the right. Um, I can tell you, strategically speaking, the right is very good at numbers. The right will do the spreadsheeting, the pew pulling, the pie charts, the statistics, numbers from the BLS, whatever it is. Um, but the left is very bad at that. But the reason why they're effective is because they would rather have absolute ownership of big tech, academia, Hollywood, entertainment, and art gallery. And that's all spheres of influence. So while we're talking about these numbers with amongst one another, it's great. You know, it gives a perspective and it crystallizes our position. Um, we're not getting anyone new because we're not influencing people, you know, and, and art is way more suggestive. Beauty is more powerful. That's all it boils down to. And that romanticism, it's difficult to understand because um, it doesn't feel as concrete. And yes, the creative process is fluid. But once you understand that there's an actual utilitarian power in regards to influencing people, you know, and, and you can scale it, um, you're going. You're never going to see it the same in regards to the cultural discourse. But maybe you're okay, Arthur. Work with me on this. You may be describing an impenetrable problem, which is that there's a nature to believing. I had a priest tell me once, this was at the beginning of the pandemic. He said, what are you guys talking about? Because some people I know are like, you know, we need to get some land. We need to get some, we need to protect ourselves. We, they're coming for us. And this priest said, yeah, no, Christians aren't the people that kill. We're the people that get killed. And in, in some ways, what he was saying is, is there's a nature, there's a contour, a spiritual contour to becoming fully, you know, I'm an Orthodox Christian, to becoming fully Orthodox, that in some ways doesn't allow you to compete with the forces you're you're talking about. It cuts me off from that competition because I don't care enough about that culture. I can't get motivated to try to save what I what you're calling. American culture because I'm a citizen of someplace else. What do you think about that? That 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 that's interesting. Um, but you can be in the culture wars. You know, what is it? Be in the world but not of it. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. It, it's. Uh, I'm with you. I'm with you on principle. I'm trying to see if how we get out of that. I problem. see what you're saying. I see what you're saying. Um, okay, so. We'll, we'll play with some concepts here. Um, I was sure. talking to a friend of mine, um, very based Orthodox guy, actually. And, you know, there's always this biblical notion that people have repeated, many pastors have repeated as well, this idea that there's two pathways for men often, and one is to become this monastic monk, and the mm-hmm. other is to be fruitful and multiply, right? And mm-hmm. there's this dichotomy that, I mean, there's this contrast that is always put up there that this is holy. You can... Either be a monk or make a family. And in between this hookup culture, shadowy nonsense, that's where the, the degeneracy and that's where everything it falls apart. I'm like, okay, I get all that. Great. But 
I think there's another path, actually. And some Christian scholars have called this the Benedict. But it's this idea, essentially, that you are a man of talent, and you can go into the culture and be a cultural warrior. Yeah. And I believe that is another path because what like I know too many faith oriented talented artists. You know, what are we to do? Yeah, that's true though. I'm with you. Like we're homeless. We're homeless and we want to serve. And actually, especially the men, especially men who act who have genuine belief in God and truly accept Christ looking at the surrounding of the urban environments, because often artists are there, they also want to do damage. And it's not because they have anger, they're not holding that sin, but they recognize that there's an effectiveness that they have been given with their hands. Like like when you sold me, you when you told me that I actually have technical skills, well, I can do something with that. <laughs> and I can en- and I can enjoy it like some introvert in a studio by himself. And when I put it out into the world, I can make Christians enjoy the work and I can make those who, who hate us <laughs> look at the work and go, Oh man, that's right. beautiful though. Right. You know, and I think there's something to that. Um, there would have to be somebody much more scholarly and, and, uh, <laughs> and, and it, it really excavated the, the theology deeper to, to, to back me up here, but no, that has I, always resonated I, with me. I don't No, No, you, my question was less like, don't do it as much as it was a question about how. So what, what I think you're describing is this unification of things fleshly with things spiritual. You know, it's, it's incarnation, right? It's how is Christ God in man? Like, what's that about? I think you have to do both. Like, I don't subscribe to running, running away. I don't, running away is not, I mean, a monk doesn't run away as much as. He just simply refuses to play by the rules. Mm-hmm. And so I, I'm a guy who likes to, the fight, like you. There's just this moment when I, I feel disconnected from a culture that I haven't, that since becoming Orthodox, I don't know. I don't, I don't hear the narrative in it often that, like yeah. voting. Voting is unappealing, not because I don't think I should vote. I'm not like, you know, some monarchist. I just don't know who to vote for. The narrative is absent. Like, it's an absent narrative for me. I don't know. The red guy tells me one thing, the blue. What I hear is... Oh, okay, okay, you know, I have, I have an answer to this. Um, uh, and and it, l- let me answer two things you, you just brought up. Sure. Um, the first thing I like to say is that This notion I mentioned of the Benedict, I will first say that, and I and I'm describing myself as well. We are stepping stones. We are stepping stones towards something more wholesome. Because if we are in the cultural front, yes, you are looking at the Leviathan in the face. You know? So let me also let me first say that I recognize that. It's a form of evangelizing in many ways. Yeah, that's right. (laughs) But, But but let me also say. Those of you who are listening, who do claim themselves to be Benedict, you have to be more towards the monk than the family, usually, because what's going to happen is, um, where's the action? It's in urban areas. In other words, there's more lasciviousness. Uh, you have to be celibate. You, ha- you can't participate in it. You have to be able to sort of be this creative monk by yourself amongst this chaos, which is um, a place of discipline. You know, so so that's that's another factor. Just uh, just to add that to those who it's actually brilliant. have a talent who listens to you, um, to the show, and, and and then the second part is um, I lost my train of thought. Yeah, no, it's okay because we got there's a million things going on here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you're getting me. You're getting my synapses, brother. That's good. <laughs> I like it. Yeah. No, it's more real that way. I think. What I would say about that last piece, and Jeremy's our editor. I always talk to him when we're, Jeremy, mm-hmm. we got Arthur Kwan Lee, Jeremy. <laughs> we really respect you, man. We were looking at hey, your stuff. Oh, thank you, brother. Uh, so the, the, what I've learned with the culture wars is that there's always this incarnate 
it's not dualistic. It's more like yin and yang, where a little bit of each side participates in the other. And what I always try to do is to move at the other, that which you would call dark. I get this. This is real. Like evil exists. Move at it as if in the darkness resides some light and we want to find it. Don't want to push. And, and maybe because I'm, I don't know, I don't want to say weak, but it, I'm womanly sometimes. And by that, I don't mean weak. What I mean is, is I want to collect. I want to cooperate. And I know it leads to weakness at times. On the other hand, I think sometimes what we find is, it's a phrase, common, common ground. I don't like that phrase. Mm -hmm. We find, we find the, the beauty of the soul because it's in there, man. It's, it's mm -hmm. in all those folks who are lost in whatever darkness is. It, it can't be that they're done. Can it? If they have life, can it be that they are in perdition if they have life? Yeah. Beauty, beauty is, beauty is far more useful than any convincing argument. This has been something That's I've been I'm trying saying. to get people to understand. Because number one, when you see beauty, you, you automatically have to engage in a relaxed state. It's sort of hypnotic, actually. <laughs> mm. um, but um, when I say, when I want Christians to utilize seduction, I don't mean it, of course, in regards to sex, the sexual market. I mean it in regards to with beauty. Yeah. Beauty is so powerful, man. And, and man. Um, Jeremy, throw the show. way that, Arthur, we're going to show your Pantocrator right now. So we're looking at it right now, um, Arthur, when we when we cut this. Okay. The thing you were just saying about, about beauty, this has to be attractive to men in 2022. Look at that thing. 100%. So, so, so let me tell you, brother, while, you, while we're looking at this work. Sure. I mean, first of all, um, I, I had somebody, this is the actual work with that cause a young man to come up to me with such vehemence and i you're just kidding told him me to, you're kidding me well, so i just told him to pull out his phone and write in google images type christ panther creator and you'll see thousands of, of this rendition historically the reason why it's awesome is because uh um mm -hmm. christianity in urban areas and i'm and I, the reason why i keep using the word urban is because this is where i spent most of my life and this is where a lot of the culture wars happen mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. um they have surrendered to the religion of leftism. And I see this ad nauseum. And in other words, we need to sort of put out this, the, the, the men who, who know the true face of God in Christ, we need to sort of shout out the rooftops to these secular Christians. <laughs> you need to get your balls back. Yeah. You know, and, 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 and I believe that they, True alpha males are holy men. It's not about muscles. It's not about tattoos and red sports cars. It's about men who are willing to speak the truth. And this is why I have this um, very um, intimidating depiction of Christ here. Because, you know, this, this idea of, you know, I'll, I'll tell you right now. Here's a good example. So I moved to Virginia a good four months ago. And again, I told you before we started this podcast, my father's church is in Oakton. Mm -hmm. um, so... I attend this church, but honestly, most of the congregation is older. So when I want to have fellowship with people my age, it, it feels a little bit like I'm missing out. So yeah. I looked for another church so as a secondary church for this reason. So I'm driving my car, looking at all these churches around the DMV area. And almost every church I drive by, I see the cross. And I see a rainbow and Black Lives Matter flag higher, placed higher, and I believe it's intentional, than the actual cross. And I can't help but think, if you tolerate everything, you don't believe in anything. And <laughs> it's an important part of Christianity not to just have your hand out to the fold and to show forgiveness and allow people to be perspicacious and grow. It's also important that we also lay down the law and manage expectations and, and, and show objective boundaries and standards. And to add to that, masculinity is the characteristic that draws expectations and boundaries. Yeah. 
So for me, it's just, I'm, I really want to see more Christian men, you know, um, embody this masculine spirit and um, with their voice, you know? Yeah. So, so, the, so that, that sort of, that sort of stuff excites me, man. You know, I I'm can... trying to do it with my brush, but it can be done with any medium actually. Well, poking around and getting to know you on the internet, I, I think you're doing it. I, I think you don't have a choice almost now. You could try to go back, but I don't think you can get put back into the matrix, man. It's too late. Yeah, several people know this, but, but I, I like I, um, you can say what you want about me, but you know, blah, 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 I get it. Like, you know, this idea, I was kind of trying to do, put Christian imagery in the mainstream and I've gotten back and forth for that. Okay. I get all that. But, but at the end of the day, I walked away from a lot of money. Mm hmm. At the end of the day, um, actions speak louder than words. And I, I recognize that the highest goal for me is, is honor even more than the actual, you know, finances in my pocket. So like, I would like to continue more lucrativeness, of course, but, um, for me, number one is my integrity and my honor. I'll fall on the sword for that a thousand times. Okay. So you're, you're, you're no dummy. You're a Christian artist who's very talented. And then here's this guy and you've asked this, been asked this before, but. Why don't you become an iconographer? <laughs> Today I ask you, like I did yesterday, to consider a donation. Our work is with incredible people trapped in very isolated and impoverished places. We call them impresarios. They're people who with light, with wonder, with amazement in their eyes, who want to do really good things, but they're cut off. They're not in touch. Maybe they don't read or write, but they know what they want and they know how to fix their own communities. We find them and move resources their way. Your donation goes to our attempt to find them and then to build their project. Well, they build their own. We assist and facilitate. That comes from Le Français to make easier, to faciliter, facilitation. That's what we do. I hope you'll donate. It actually matters. We're in a $75,000 match right now. A wonderful family has made it possible for us to double your donation until January 1st, up to $75,000. One of you out there listening to this can make it happen today. I dare you. Do it. Do it! I'm serious. Make it happen. I dare you. Just do it! Go for it. Do it. Do it. Why don't you become an iconographer? <laughs> um, so in line with that spirit, brother, I am producing a, a Bible series right now. And I, and I want this to be like, I don't want to use such a lofty word like magnum opus, but I want to produce... I don't know how it's going to be down the line. Again, this is the mind of an artist in the studio. So um, let me articulate this. I get that. I, I, I want to pr produce 12 paintings from the Old Testament. Large scale. Genesis, the creation story. The fall, Cain and Abel. I want every canvas to be 48 by 60 inches. Wow. So I want these to be large paintings. And what I like to do, and again, I'm an independent artist right now. Uh, again, I can't go back to those six art dealers that I had. So once I'm in the production, like, you know, maybe beyond 60% of its production, which is going to take me some time because these are big campuses. Mm -hmm. I want to send out a roll call. And um, I guess I'm also saying this to you. If you know people who have spaces to run an event and to showcase the series of paintings, you know, to, to, to blow Great. it up and make people witness modern Christian painting. Then, Great. um, so, so, so this is something I'm trying to do, but again, I am, I'm also trying to do, there's new painting material, material available today. You know, so I also want to utilize these new techniques and, and approaches and add an element of, again, like seduction, you need to, address things that are attractive and beautiful and, and and utilize that for other people to be like 
you know, people who may not be Christian, I want them to see the work and be like, oh, what is this? I want to check this out. And then boom, they experience it further. Do, do you do you have a, what was your training regimen? Where, where did the notion of art come from? Was it, was it, was it in a formal institution? Did you just paint as a kid? How did it start? I, I was, I was very blessed to come from a two parent household. We're a traditional Christian family, but I will say we're very, uh, we're very weird <laughs> because, um, we're all creative. Yeah. Sister just was doing design. My brother was into like acting and all this stuff. And my, my, you know, my father is a minister. My mother is a composer who's got a dissertation in music theory. So, you know, we already were kind of acclimated with utilizing the, our creativity in a certain direction. Okay. Like my mother's always playing cello for the congregation or piano during service. You know, my sister does the violin and sings. When my brother was a youth leader, when he was young, they're like acting out scenes during Christmas and the, you know, like, like they do different things. You know what I mean? It's like, it, it's that like part came the creative investment was, was, um, spoke for itself tenfold. But I will say, in an odd family, I was the most odd. Because as this is all happening, John, I, I always notice this. Uh, this is, I guess, more intimately speaking. I'm looking at my sister play the violin. I'm looking at my brother act. My dad's on the stage speaking. My mother plays her instrument. They, they're on stages, right? People see them. Yeah. I'm an introvert painter who goes by himself in a studio. <laughs> I'm not on a stage and I want to be by sure. myself and I want to, I want to, I want to explore the puzzle of painting. I want to be in this reality tunnel of materiality and layering and color theory and formalism. And I always felt weird in that way. So I kind of feel like in regards to this biblical series, because now I'm being public and going on shows like this mm -hmm. or speaking at certain engagements, going to County Before Country with Michael Foster's and speaking about beauty. I feel like I'm actually the late bloomer in the family. Absolutely. And then now, now going public, but kind of more full force. Cause I'm even trying to make, again, I really am like trying to do this Bible, biblical series I make. I'm not going to just go to the Bible belt. I'm going to show, you know, to certain areas as well, but I want to go to like, this is the goal. This is down the goal to get, to get the correct patronage who understands the culture and the mission. I get this to support me to go to places like the belly of the beef showed in Chelsea, New York, where they have literal work that is about destroying the West, put it right in the center there. Like that would, that's, that's fun. That, Bob, first of all, that is fun. <laughs> it, yeah. it gets your blood. That's, you see what I'm talking about? No, like, no. It's a, it's a call to, again, it's a call to the masculine, you know, it's, it's, it's wrestling at eight. Yes, sir. When you're eight and you got this kid on the block and it's fighting that kid. And it's not even about hating the kid. It's about, the match it's about the moment yeah i know what yeah, you're saying yeah for sure well yeah. i can't say i can't listen i got a kid in new york doing i was telling you she's a jazz singer she's a juilliard she's got all these same it's like kind of sad on some level that an artist with an opposing worldview who still is technically sound and beautifully you know engaged what's the problem what is the problem with an open dialogue and allowing that to to breathe a little and i guess it goes back to your dark and light idea right it does go back to a type of cosmic battle right yeah they want um you know i'll tell you right now what i'm going to say about the fine art, fine art industry applies to all creative fields today because again, I know artists across the board, you know, believe me, like, you know, we've all shared similar stories. Uh, sometimes the model is a little bit different, but overall it's the same theme, which is that today, the top of the pyramid for all these industries, they're, they're puppets of the dark one. You know and what I saw it this week? They're, they're on the radical left, basically. You know, the so, party of sin there. Tell me what you think about this. I'm not the greatest at pop culture, but I, I have had this thought all week. Dave Chappelle, what's never said about Dave Chappelle as he goes on Saturday Night Live and basically comes off of Saturday Night Live last week and gets more crap than he did before he went on. 
people never say this. You know, he's a Muslim. Oh. Huh. He, he had a conversion. I, I heard about that. Okay, interesting. So what I think about that is, is I'm not going to get into the theology of Islam. We can't. I have on my podcast. But what I want to mm-hmm. get at is, is there is pretension to creator there. There is the pretension to the one to something like light. Now, I don't know that Islam is light. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying, though, is is he is not easily understood and digested by the group of people you're talking about. And as he gets more and more aged and older and more and more Muslim, you can see that he's not going to (laughs) fit. As acceptable as he used to be, you can feel it. You can feel there's something going on with him. And I I believe that's what it is. I believe that's what it is. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, ultimately, these these people, they just, they're angry at God. And they're, they're so angry that they have to put their index fingers into their ears and call themselves atheists and get into the culture and try to destroy the, destroy the fabric from the inside out. This is all it is. I mean, I can tell you, um, that the only way we're going to actually have a way, a direction to go forward is if we can actually get the talent on our side to come together, which obviously what I, this is something I've also been working on in conjunction to getting some serious freedom loving wealth to spread and proliferate this imagery. So this Um, is, this is your space right now, right? This idea of you said patronage, organization, finding a superstructure in which Christians. Now, I'm up for this if you want to. We got a couple, a little bit more. I want to try to define this concept of Christian for you or, or have you define it. Because, see, us Orthodox folks, we get a little nervous about some of the powers that be in America. Because we see Christian folks in this part of the world as having perpetrated some of the problems that you're now identifying. Mm. If that makes any sense. You're talking about the Christian conference network kind of thing where, where they're basically Christian celebrities that are um, not actually on their mission anymore, but utilizing the term and, and the, and, and the shape of Christianity to self aggrandize for sure. Their own. Yeah. Yeah. That's one group, but I would also say there's even some presuppositions, some serious principles within what we would call Protestant Christianity or whatever you want to call it, the type of Christianity that it has come to this part of the world through the through 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 Catholicism and then through Luther that has certain presuppositions, building blocks that are what we now know to be secularism. In other words, there's a historical connection. And so when you say we need to get a group together in order to fight sort of against the powers that be, part of that resonates. Part of it from the Orthodox world is like, wait a minute, which players are these going to be? Because there's certain edicts in Christianity, Calvinist theology, and, and there's this certain thing going on with a lot of Protestantism where wealth and materialism are too easily accepted as the norm. Um, where the mm. goal Well, then maybe I made a mistake because uh, I've already started an art collective of super-based artists called the Genesis Council. You and... never made a mistake, but tell me about that. What does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> so basically, um, we're trying to take the culture back. Um, there are things in the works. And I'm speaking too early about what we want to do next. Um, But basically we have, you know, super world-class photographers, filmmakers, you know, all these people who want to create genuine, beautiful art, but not in the stereotypical kitschy way, you know, like often when um, they, they imagine artists of faith or even conservative artists, like, you're painting red, white, and blue bald eagles and the Statue <laughs> of Liberty. And that's a stereotype that they, they actually allow for you to show your work. Yes. Because yes. then people pigeonhole, 
Oh, that's right. You guys can't make art. No, open a textbook. We make the best one. You just shut us up since postmodern thinking. Right. But basically, uh, um, I, I've created this art collective where we can congregate, support each other, and use each other as a network. That's part one. But part two, which is the next step, the next phase, which is going to take some time because, you know, funding, whatsoever you call it, is... Uh, it's different. Eh. But basically, we, we like to... We like to open up an actual space, a cultural space, whether you know it's kind of gallery, you know, uh, performance plays, this kind of stuff. But it's going to be based. So, 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 so there's things in the works, but I'll just leave it at that because it's too early for me to really dive into it too much. Well, I don't. I think I would commend to any human being with a beautiful spirit like yours to enter culture. And infiltrate it, man. And by the way, it's not that all aspects of whatever the left is are bad, but the dying part of our culture should be we have to we have to reinvigorate it, man. Mm -hmm. You won't have any pushback from me. I'm I just love I love history. And so when I see somebody painting this Pontocrater like yourself, I see a bridge. There's like a bridge in you. I don't know if you know this. That's what attracted me to you and your work is the symbolism. You come easily to symbolism somehow. Somehow you come easily to the mystery and have all this power and authority in your paintings that are just, they're just invitations to human beings to wake up. Brother, yes. You're kind of, um, when I said that, I recognize I'm a stepping stone, bridge, whatever you want to call it. Like, this is the power of art closes those gaps my buddy who is my dearest he's my godson he's a painter uh his skill is i really think it's off the charts you would enjoy i'll introduce wow, you wow okay he's cool he's world class he's an iconographer he's a monk father Silouan. Mm. i'll send you the link why i'm bringing him up is because he you see he would see this as someone in culture who is going to be someone who eventually leads others toward what he's doing. Now, here's what I mean. If he takes his icon and drops it in New York City, everyone immediately thinks of it as like quaint or something. You get what I'm saying? <laughs> they can't yes. identify with it. They're like, oh, it looks like an old Greek painting. Thanks, buddy. Thanks, you're so cute, and you look at your robes. They, it's almost as if he can't participate because he, he doesn't have the bona fides. Yeah, I want to I want to make a splash, brother. I know, right? And he can't do it. And he would see your work as leading people toward what he would call right the highest form of art, which is iconography. I know he would mm -hmm. say that. In fact, maybe that's our next talk. Oh, yeah, me, you, and him. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. You, you know. You know. Um, I would have to. There'll be a short talk because I actually agree with him. <laughs> yeah, I know, because, man. because the production of my biblical series is just that. Because again, ideally, the art is religious in nature. Right. You know, um, that that's and again, what I'm trying to do is in a sort of mainstream manner revitalize Christian aesthetics. Because there's so much talent, like your brother, who's making this art, but it's often in an echo chamber, which is undeserving for that talent. Do you feel alone these days? Or are you starting to get a crew? How are you feeling these days in terms of your vision? Are you married? Um, no. Oh, man. So you're a catch out there in the Christian world. Well, you know, I, I don't. I don't look at it like that. I, I look at it more as um, right now I have a calling and I have yeah. a job. See, you're and a monk. <laughs> yeah, that's that, like I said, you need to be, if you want to be truly a Benedict, you actually have to be celibate. So this is, this is the actual test. If you, it's not enough to be, oh, I'm talented. Okay, well, um, are you staying in shape? Are you this? distracted by lustful temptations you know or, or are you able to actually um 
put on some Japanese jazz and then and then drink a little wine and just paint and just go in the flow and, and actually have that as the as the highest pleasure. That, that, that that's my flow, baby. You know, it's yeah. like it's the greatest high to be honest. But um, I, I mean, there's a lot of artists, you know, um, who have a similar mission to what I'm doing, but like I'm trying to. What I like to do, again, I got to find the right patronage, but I'm, I, I like to do some mainstream cultural uppercuts because this is what I've seen is that, remember earlier when I said, I want to see pastors talk about hypergamy, physical, you know, health, you know, these kind of things. Well, in that same vein, I want to see our artists put their work into places like even using some of their language to show that we even do that better mm-hmm. because it's pointing upwards mm-hmm. the true the good and the beautiful literally just experience it behold what god has given me you know yeah and what i've come to see is that you can always see a failing society because the artists become spreaders of their own vanity rather than worshipers of the sacred and if i'm going to try to do some you know, if I'm going to try to cure anything in my domain, in the talent that I've been giving, then I want to put the reverence in the darkest area. And, and, you know, maybe that's a part of my upbringing as a martial artist, too, that why no I doubt. want to go into action, no I doubt. don't know. No doubt. But, but um, for some reason, I've, I've always felt like this, this desire to do, to make a statement where, you know, I, I mean, the pattern speaks for itself, you know, like I've been targeted by Antifa, BLM came to one of my shows, I had fireworks shot at me, I've already dealt with enough of these loonies to realize that, you know, why am I still doing this? Yeah. Like normal people would kind of stop and try to keep themselves at a safer distance, but um. I have a warrior streak in me as well, which is a part of Christianity also. But um, some yeah. people have it more pronounced a little bit, but I don't want to do it physically. I want to do it in the arts and make statements. Why don't so, you yeah. and I keep talking? We're putting a concert. We have a concert series next year uh, for our nonprofit, and it, we're going to do some of them here in Greenville at our uh, restaurant. has a cool little space at this place called Hampton station. And there's something to be done there. Um, Mm. I don't know what it is yet. And uh, let's see, we're working on patronage as always, but there could be something really cool. And the whole thrust of what you're doing, the whole, the arc of your story, it really is educational and, and informative for all of us. It's really helpful to hear. Yeah, this is what's going to happen if uh, if you go into the mainstream channels as a Christian artist who's also confident. You know, they're going to get uncomfortable pretty quickly, so you're going to have to shut up. And if you don't shut up, you might as well just have your own way. And, and I guess what I'm saying is that if you are a Christian who has talent, might as well just start independent, unlike me who's starting all over. Um you know, it started all over two years ago and rebuilding from there. And, um, but, um, are you I'm happy? Glad I can be, are you happy that this is all gone this way? Are you I'm happy peace? looking in retrospect. In retrospect, I'm happy. I'm, I'm happy I've gone this way, but when it was happening, it was very disconcerting. I will be honest. Um, when I got blackballed, I was actually, you know, I was, you know, I was, I was, Little, you know, not even little. I was frustrated because I spent 10 years in the gallery scene to get to the point that I was. Mm -hmm. And because of the wrong opinions, they basically swept me under the rug. So um, I shouldn't have, I should have expected that after a certain point, actually. But I just kept trying to, I just didn't know any other way because we just don't have any other way. Yeah. Um, But um, I'm happy now because everything I do, you know, like even on my website, I have like a support section. And it's pretty, I mean, it's seldom, but 
if I get enough people supporting, at least it's all because it's genuinely who I am. Right. And, and so free. like, like, yeah, like I, at, at the point I'm at now, I have enough patronage where they're, they're covering like, you know, a percentage of my art materials, which is already awesome. But I like to get that to a point where I have so much support, you know, that I can start doing some, I, I mean, my hope is to get to the point where I can just, whether it's with a couple sharks or, or whether it's collective, I can just start being able to afford the rent of storefront spots and do pop-ups and, and, and to just, you know, do, do some, just show them, look at this, witness it itself. But um, I'm happy now because wherever I go forward, it's, it's all me, you know, it's, That's it's right. like, part, That's right. yeah, it's, it's all on me. So um, even if I've lost like, legitimate galleries and those connections you know which which is nice you know uh in regards to security um i couldn't truly be who i was and i became an artist because it was what i was attracted to and it resonated with you know who i naturally was so i'm gonna hook you uh, now, together. Now, now, now i'm gonna yeah. put you together with father Silwan. this guy uh you'll respect him he's a city guy who uh yeah, he he's super talented. I'll I'll send you his way, mm. and I, I, yeah, I think yeah. you guys will have a great talk, great talk. But this has been a joy. Oh. So tell us, we can follow you and find you online, right? I'll put the link to your um. Yeah, your you, you, can, you can find me. My, my my main thing is um, my, my my main thing is obviously like you know my website. If you want to contact me, go to the contact form. If you are interested in getting uh, original works or paintings. You can also contact me as well. You know, um, uh, there's there's something for all price points. You know, uh, um, so bear that in mind as well. Um, I, I mean, I mean, you know, certain range you can get prints and catalogs, things like that. But you know, um, if you want to put some actual beauty in your home, you know, those empty walls are damn waste because it does start locally. Beauty works at the local level. So that your kids can see work that's meaningful yeah, to you. No, it's real. Um, and secondly, social media is in order of importance. Number one is my Instagram because it is an image board, right? Uh, number two, I guess, would be uh, my Twitter, which is pretty quiet. Um, and number three would be my Substack, but that's all Arthur Kwon Lee. Um, yeah, and that, that's where you can find everything, guys. And you know, and if you're an artist if you have a talent and want to congregate with other creative people, you can look at the Genesis council. Yeah. I saw you on there. We'll move some artists that way. If we, if, uh, if stuff comes in for sure, but okay. most of all, I think cool. on our show, what you're doing as per trying to infiltrate or recover or reconstitute modernity with this old fashioned vision of beauty I think it's to be commended, man. Thank you, brother. Man, that's uh, yeah, I really like how you said that. It, it's it's um something I'll keep dear to me as I go forward with this biblical series. Please do. I can't wait to uh, hear more about that. And so, guys, Arthur Kwan Lee, um, and listen, very few of us have been in a place where we could see, right. We could see the everything from the mountaintop. And that's a blessing and a curse, man. Blessing and a curse. So you got them both. Yes, brother. So it's your gifts. And thanks for coming on. And you and God I will talk you, again soon. And I'll, I'm gonna I'll connect you with my friend. Really, I really think you guys would have a great conversation. And um, thanks for coming on, Arthur. Who Thank loves you, you man? There's about 50 things there we gotta keep talking about. I'd say number one is there seems to be some sort of continuum happening with Arthur Kwan Lee and his journey towards something like transcendent art. I don't know where it's going, but I do know today we got to hear a little bit about maybe a fight back. I'm always interested in that concept. How does it look? But we wish you good luck, Arthur. Thanks for coming on the show. Anybody interested in more from him, check out our links. 
He's got a great website. With His work is really fascinating and very, very unique. And I think it's fantastic. So to Arthur, thanks for coming on. See you soon. We'll keep talking. Father Silouan and you got to talk. This was, why are we talking about rabbits? That was our talk with Arthur. Please check us out at www.first-things.org.